Well, thank you guys so much for joining us for SBB University today. We are going to be doing an overview of senior living options here in Southwest Florida. So I just want to thank um, everyone that is tuned in today. We look forward to some um, questions and answers and some great dialogue. So I just uh, want to talk a little bit about what Seniors Blue Book is. Uh, we are an authoritative publication that produces a free resource guide. Um, that's available to you by mail. Uh, we are taking mail orders right now for the new publication that will be hitting the streets in October. You can get on that early reservation list by calling 239-776-7353. Additional copies will be available for you at the Healthy Life Center at Lee Health, CVS Pharmacies, and Walgreens. And basically what this resource guide is, is an A through Z directory um, on anything to keep you from an aging well. So resources for aging well. So a good example that I like to give is if you're looking for an audiologist, you're gonna look in the A's. If you're looking for an elder law attorney, you're gonna look in the E's. Um, and then if you're looking for senior housing, home care, or home health, you're gonna look in the back of the book in the, in the grid sections that allow you to compare resources apples to apples. So I have spent the entire weekend laying out this book. <laughs> it is uh, my uh, pride and joy, my baby. And I can't wait for all of you to see the new edition and let me know what your thoughts are. So without further ado, we're gonna get started with this morning's panel discussion on senior housing options in Southwest Florida. And we'll start with introducing um, Roy. Let's, let's have you go for first. Roy Mitchell over at American House, uh, Benina Springs. Thank you, Amanda. So yeah, my name's Roy Mitchell. I'm the sales director at American House, Benina Springs. Um, American House has been around for over 40 years, uh, serving seniors in multiple states. Um, we've been down in Florida for about five years. Uh, we have a, a couple of buildings in the area in Bonita Springs, Coconut Point, and in Fort Myers. Um, we offer all levels of care, in, in, including independent living, assisted living, and memory care. Um, I'm, I'm the expert on independent living today, so if you have any questions for me, please ask. Perfect. Thank you, Roy. All right. Good morning. Gay Hallowell over at uh, the Opal at North Naples, a specialized memory care community. Thank you, Amanda. Um, as uh, Amanda just said, we are exclusively memory care only. Um, we are a specialized memory care community. Some people say, what does that mean? We were purposely built to only provide for memory care residents and their needs. Um, we have the only, what's called the small house cottage approach to memory care, the only such community in Collier County. And what that means is that rather than one large building or a wing of a building or a section of a building, we actually have five separate little buildings, um, each with no more than 14 residents designed to meet their cognitive and physical needs with regards to dementia and other cognitive challenges. So it's exciting to be here. The Opal at North Naples actually purchased this property exactly a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, they sought it out because of its uniqueness and their commitment to memory care. So it's really exciting to be here. And uh, thanks so much for having us. Perfect, thanks Gay. All right, we're gonna scoot on over to Ms. Jennifer Hoops who is here representing Assisted Living and Equity Ownership Independent Living. Good morning, Amanda. Thank you for having us. Uh, so uh, as Amanda mentioned, my name is Jennifer Hoops. I am the Director of Marketing here at Arbor Trace. We are a 100% equity ownership senior living community. We offer assisted living as well as independent living. And again, it is 100% equity ownership. So you actually own your own home and we'll get into some, some details on that later. Um, but we have been uh, in the community since 1991. So we've been here for quite a while um, and we're located in North Naples, right on the Gulf. So we have incredible views. Perfect, thank you. All right, next on the drawing board is Ms. Kelly Okutso with Life Home Health. Hi, Amanda. Thank you. You did that pretty well. Um, <laughs> Not perfect. Practicing. Oh, oh, cute. Oh, cute. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's great to see all these wonderful faces amidst all of the changes in healthcare recently. It's nice that we can all get together. 
and I am the managing partner at Life Home Health. We are a private duty medical and non-medical model of in-home care. So we provide services in the comfort of your home, which has been quite a bit during this time. Mm -hmm. But we work in wonderful partnerships with communities like The Opal and Arbor Trace and B and American House so that we can help folks transition into those communities when or if the time is right, but also be able to provide uh, in-home care all the way through even the end of life if that's your choice in your home. Because we are a medical and non-medical model, we provide anything from just engagement, so some fun, infusing some joy in your day, perhaps your family lives out of town, your kids are out of town and isolation is on the rise, especially right now. And you just need a little bit of one-on-one -on -one engagement, someone to do your shopping and your errands, a little bit of house cleaning, all the way through to some personal care needs, when or if that might happen. Um, that's a pretty intimate experience. So it's good to really develop a relationship with a private agency early on so that if or when you do need those, that kind of care, you already have an established trust with someone and we call those engagement specialists or care partners. And then um, if you ever needed any kind of medical care, perhaps you've had a surgery or you have been discharged home from the hospital and you're really confused about your medications and what, what do you take and when, um, we also offer skilled nursing, case management, very different from care management. So we can talk about that later if that question comes up. Um, to really just case manage and tie everything together and um, refer you to different organizations in the community that partner for all of your care. And then we also offer a pretty unique model with therapies, private pay. So we work side by side with some of the Medicare home health companies, the Part B and Part A companies that are out there. And um, when or if you may um, fall out of qualification for some of those Medicare benefits and you want to continue paying privately for speech, occupational, or physical therapy, then we can offer that in your home as well. Most of our providers are also Part B providers, so you can kind of flip flop back and forth between when your Medicare is, when you're eligible for Medicare and when you would like to continue on for more maintenance and therapy. So we're really excited to be here to talk about all of the ways that uh, we can bring some more joy to your day and in your home. Perfect, thank you, Kelly. And last, but certainly not least, Mr. Joe Chambers with V at Bentley Village. How are you this morning? I'm well, thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Um, v at Bentley Village, we are the continuing care retirement community that is located in North Naples. So we've been around since 1986. So um, been around for quite a while. And, but we've also done some major renovations to our community and we're happy to be part of this webinar today and part of the educational process here. This is a great thing that you all are doing. So thanks for having us. Absolutely. I think we'll start with you, Joe, um, because the CCRC model is very specific where you need to be an independent um, individual before moving into one of these communities. So right. talk to us about exactly what is a CCRC and what are the um, what are the financial and the healthcare requirements to move into one? Well, it's an interesting and complicated question. So um, a continuing care retirement community is, that's what we refer to as a CCRC. A lot of us in the industry use our own lingo or acronym, so bear with us. Um, but a continuing care retirement community is a retirement community that offers all different levels of care on one campus. So um, typically it starts off with independent living and then there's care available if and when a resident needs it for as long as they need it. There'll be assisted living, skilled nursing, memory support. It just really depends on the community. At Bentley Village, we offer all levels of care for our residents. But typically a continuing care retirement community is a proactive move, not a reactive move. So I always tell folks to think about it that way. Um, it's almost like buying a long-term care insurance policy that just happens to come with an apartment, right? So a lot of our folks come in very proactive. They have to have a medical and a financial assessment. And that's pretty much true for all continuing care retirement communities. They wanna make sure that you can live independently, 
um, for a number of years in the community before needing care. And then financially, they just want to make sure that your money is going to outlast you and you're not going to outlast your money. You know, so it's really one of those things where make sure it's a good financial fit for um, people coming in. So there is a medical and a financial, but again, it's a proactive move and it's a great choice for some people because there are all levels of care on campus available when they need it for as long as they need it. Now, Joe, it can be very confusing. There are several different types of uh, continuing care retirement communities out there. Do you want to just go, kind of give us a brief overview on the differences between a type A, B, and C contract when they're looking into these communities? Sure. That's a great question. There are different types of continuing care retirement communities. Um, typically, there's a type A, which is what Bentley Village is, and that's what we call all-inclusive. So what that means is that a resident will come in and they'll pay an entrance fee and then a monthly fee. And the entrance fee is a one-time entrance fee. It could be 80% um, refundable, 50% refundable, or nothing back when someone leaves the community. So the monthly fee is there for um, ongoing monthly maintenance. But the benefit of a type A is that the monthly fee stays the same regardless of how much care someone would need when they need it. So if they were moved to assisted living, skilled nursing, or memory support, they would continue to pay the same rate for independent living that they would for um, assisted living or higher level of care. So that's where that long-term care insurance policy type, it's not a long-term care insurance policy, but it's similar. So that's why people buy into a type A because they know when they need that care, they know how much, they can reasonably predict how much it's gonna cost in the future. Now a type B is similar. A type B continuing care retirement community is typically gonna offer the same levels of care, an entrance fee, a monthly fee, but they're gonna have what they call limited life care or a discount off of care when you need it. So it might be a 20% discount off a of market rate or 15% discount or it might be a limited number of days. There's all different contracts out there for a type B uh, continuing care retirement community. So it works for folks that typically it's not, as, it's not as a stringent medical qualification sometimes. It depends on the community. Um, we're not a type B, so I can only really speak to the type A and what we do from a medical perspective. Then there's the type C. Now a type C is what we call a la carte. So you're basically, the uh, type C continuing Care retirement community will have all those levels of care, but you'll come in, you'll pay an entrance fee and a monthly fee like you will with the A and the B, but those, that monthly fee will typically be lower for independent living, and then it'll be higher for assisted living, and you basically pay as you go. So there's that, that, that risk factor where some folks say, well, if I'm not going to need the care, why should I pay for it in advance? You know, so it's really just doing a cost analysis to see what type or what contract type works best for someone if they're looking for a proactive move to a continuing care retirement community. Perfect. Now, what kind of tax advantages are there for um, the word buy-in is not really appropriate, is it? It's, you'd really need to call it an entrance fee because you're not actually purchasing it. So what type of tax advantages are um, included with investing in a continuing care retirement community? Well, it's not really an investment either. So it's really, it, it's an entrance fee that basically underwrites your future health care is the way to look at it. So um, again, it's like a long-term care insurance policy. So there's no ownership. It's not fee simple uh, real estate transaction. So our residents don't get the equity when they leave the community, but they will get the refundable portion that they contract for. Now, the because I'm not, I have to legally say this or um, our attorneys in Chicago will come back and say, hey, Joe, but I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a tax attorney or a CPA, so that's my disclosure, right? But uh, continuing care retirement communities typically have a um, tax benefit for the non-refundable portion of the entrance fee. It can be considered prepaid medical expense. And then also the monthly fee, a portion of that can also be considered prepaid medical expense as well. So folks are able to use that as an advantage on their taxes a one-time for the entrance fee and a one-time an ongoing deduction for the monthly fee. So there are some benefits there and it can go up to almost 50% um, of the entrance fee or the monthly fee could be considered tax deductible. And it depends on your income and all sorts of things that you need to talk to your accountant or your attorney about. Perfect. Okay. And that leads us real, really slide into Jen because um, you mentioned that you're 
that you're not equity ownership. Um, Jen's community is, uh, you do actually purchase it, Jen. So talk to us about the differences between um, a continuing care retirement community and a rental community versus an equity ownership. Sure. So Arbor Trace is very unique in that it is the 100% equity ownership community. And so as far as us compared to a CCRC, the biggest difference is really going to be that entrance fee. So uh, here at Arbor Trace and in uh, a purchase community, you're not going to have a entrance fee and you're not going to have a physical assessment. Uh, you're purchasing your home. It's as simple as that. Um, so that's probably going to be the biggest difference as far as us in a CCRC. Um, with and also the healthcare. So uh, Joe mentioned, you know, the healthcare is included in all that in a way. Uh, here at Arbor Trace, the assisted living facility and the healthcare is not included. It's actually completely separate. So you do not pay for healthcare and until or unless you actually use it, um, which is very unique. It allows residents who live here the ability to hire in home health like Kelly to come in and assist them in their home. Uh, you know, we encourage them to stay in their home as long as it's safe and as long as that's a decision that them and their family makes. Um, and so it's very unique in that. Uh, the difference between us and say a rental community is again, the equity ownership. So in a rental community, you are renting your home. There's no equity in that. Um, they may include services or it may be at an additional cost. That depends on the rental structure. Um, but with ownership here, you own your home, you are able to control every aspect of that, what you want to do in your home, if you want to make modifications. Um, so it's, it's unique that you, you have that control and you also have the services and amenities that come along with a senior living community. And, um, and also the healthcare, like we mentioned, the assisted living portion of that. So, um, you know, every, everybody has great services and amenities and, and that sort of thing. I think it's just uh, what fits people's lifestyle the best. It's important to, to look into. Perfect. Now, there are some additional fees when you pur purchase just as if there were an HOA. Um, talk to us about your board, for, for instance, and then because um, I think that's unique as well. Yes. Yeah, so we are uh, not only 100% uh, equity, but we are resident owned and managed. That means that the residents have total and complete control of their future here. Uh, back in 2007, we were actually owned by a developer and the residents at that time all got together and said, you know what, we can do a better job at managing this community and owning this community. And so they actually all got together and purchased it out from another developer and it became resident ownership. And so that's really, really important, not only uh, to us employees, but the residents as well, um, because the decisions that are being made here are being made by people who are living here, not someone up north or out west or something. Um, and so they're, they're very attentive to uh, the, managing this community well. Uh, they want the best of the best, which is great. Um, we have several different boards. Um, so we have uh, boards for uh, two different parts of our community. So I'll say associations, two different associations, and then a uh, management board. And the management company is actually made up of residents. Um, and so it works out very well. There are fees associated. So when you purchase, of course, you have the purchase price of your home, just like probably where you live now. And so you would have that cost. On top of that, there is a monthly condo fee. And there's also a monthly club membership. The monthly condo fee is a basic condo fee that most people are probably aware of. It covers uh, grounds and landscaping, fire safety, uh, lots of utilities are included, water, sewer, electricity, all of those things, cable. So basic condo fee. And then on top of that, you would have the club membership, which is where you'll find most of the amenities. So dining, transportation, activities, um, emergency response system. Uh, so lots of different amenities that are included in the uh, club membership. Um, and then above that, if you were to use the healthcare services, then that again would be a separate cost. Perfect. And we, we're going to loop back around to you to talk about assisted living. Um, Roy, uh, with uh, American House Bonita Springs, um, go ahead and jump on and talk to us about the differences between a traditional independent living community versus you know, your purchase or your buy-in. Absolutely. I mean, and like Jennifer said, it, it really depends on what you're looking for um, and what kind of financial situation you're in. The big difference for us is going to be your upfront costs. 
Um, so for a community like us, it's a rental community. Um, so you have a month to month lease. Um, there is a small community fee that you pay when you first move in. Um, that does cover you through your levels of care. So through your independent living assisted and memory care. Um, with, with us, obviously there's a different rate for the independent living as there is for assisted and memory care, which is obviously something you have to plan for. Um, but that's the, the big difference is going to be um, your upfront cost with our community. Now, another big difference I think is uh, the services that are included as far as um, like housekeeping and, and meals. Talk to us about what is included in that, that monthly rent that you pay. Absolutely. So for our independent living residents, and it will vary from community to community, um, you have your utilities included, you receive weekly housekeeping. Um, so when I say your utilities, everything except for landline phone, you do receive two meals a day, breakfast and dinner. Um, and then there's a, a large amount of activities and exercise programs and things that our residents are all um, allowed to use. And then we also provide transportation to doctors um, and different shops and different places that they want to go to. Okay, perfect. Yeah, you answered one of my questions. Um, a lot of people that are thinking about giving up their home and moving into any of these communities, one of their first questions that they ask is, can I continue to see the doctors that I'm, that I'm used to seeing? Um, and I know that tradition, you just, you just mentioned that you have um, transportation that goes to doctors. Do you have a certain mile radius that they can stick within? Yeah, absolutely. So we, you know, uh, most of my residents keep their doctors that they have currently. Um, we do have a 15 mile radius, which in this area, many of us know that includes a lot of doctors. So um, I haven't had any issues with anyone not being able to get to the doctor. We also do have specialists that come in um, and kind of throughout the year, we'll have a dermatologist, a, a dentist, we'll have um, uh, uh, podiatrists and different kinds of specialists that might come in and see our residents and they can just sign up for those. Perfect. Okay, Kelly. Kelly Okutso. Yay. I got it right. <laughs> All right. So Kelly's kind of the bridge between um, an independent and say assisted living. So I want to bring you in. I'm trying to kind of go in the chronological order of, of how someone would age. Um, talk to us about what type of services, I know you kind of went over the type of services that you can provide, but how it helps someone stay independent in their home and age in place. Your home is not necessarily just a building with four walls and a roof. It's whatever you make it. So if today your home is the home that you purchased 30 or 40 years ago with your husband, it can still be that same feeling of safety and security and joy when you move into a retirement community. So we want to be that exactly that. We want to be the bridge to help you be as independent as you possibly can or even a perceived level of independence. If we want to, if you just want to lean on us a little bit as a crutch for some things that have become a little bit more challenging. So oftentimes we're thought of as a transition company um, or a transition partner. If there comes a time that you do decide you want more socialization, more interaction, more of a retirement type of a feeling, because so many of your friends are leaving or they're snowbirding and you're now full time in Naples or Southwest Florida and you want a little bit more action going on in your day, then um, sometimes what we can do is really help you get acclimated um, while you're transitioning into a new setting that's new and an environment that's new. So we do often act as that transition to help you wherever you are in your home. So lots of different things. I guess it's kind of a big answer to a big question. It is a big question. It's important. It's an important question. Now, this is, a, I always say the health, the maze of healthcare. It can be very confusing um, to decipher the differences between a private pay um, home care company, a non-medical companion care company, a registry, an agency, the differences between Medicare certified and skilled companies that can still provide those services. Even I get confused, as you know. <laughs> Try to sum that up for us. Uh, <laughs> that's you know, a really somehow. big question. <laughs> so that's a really big question. And I think the best way to probably tackle that is to know that you have um, certified companies that take Medicare on assignment or commercial insurance. 
and then you have private duty companies. So if you just narrow down those two buckets, within those buckets, there are some amazing benefits. So we want to try to be an organization that helps clients identify when their benefits can be activated and when they can't. So how can we get this thing paid for? That's a big question. And I think if we really just narrow it down to what do I need and how am I gonna pay for it? Then we can really start kind of diving into um, some of the resources that are available. So under Medicare, you've got um, hospice and home health. So those are two very critical and palliative care falls in there too um, with some private pay features. But, um, you know, I think it's important to know that whoever you work with knows those things so that you're not getting charged privately for things that you could really be accessing under your Medicare or commercial insurance benefit. So we can unpack the Medicare side if you want, but because I'm in the private side, I've actually been in both. Um, I'm happy to be a resource wherever I can be on the private side. Um, the private duty model offers a couple of ways that you can register your business. You can register your business as a private duty agency or a private duty registry. So really, the, there's not a huge difference between the two. We, we both provide all of the range of services um, in your home. Some provide medical and non-medical. Some only provide non-medical. So I think it's important to really sort of think about what you're going to need ongoing. If you've been diagnosed with a progressive illness of any kind and you know that that's going to inevitably um, progress or worsen, you may want to look at a company that offers medical and non-medical services in your home. The same goes for if you're looking for a retirement community, you want to be looking at the license that they have and what they can accommodate in terms of your illness, your need, your diagnosis, or your medical care. So within that private duty umbrella, those two main buckets of um, registry and agency, the best way to really um, tackle that question or unpack that question is to say that a private duty agency employs employees. They are our employees as a certified or accredited, not certified, I'm sorry, um, registered agency. So those are people that we hire and that we train and that we employ and insure. We take the taxes out, it's all, it's all under our payroll. A registry, those are all independent contractors. So that registry may or may not have workers comp and all the necessary insurances. Most do these days. They're not required, but most do. And within that registry model, the company would be acting more like a broker. So they would connect you with your independent contractor and your relationship is with that independent contractor directly. So those are the, the big differences. And sometimes you'll see because of that, the overhead at an agency may be a little bit more than a registry because we employ those people. So the price difference is where you may see some differences between the registry model and the agency model. Uh, because the registry is connecting you direct with a independent contractor. There may not be as many fees for that registry um, versus the agency employing that person. So then to unpack that a little bit further within the agency and the registry models, they may provide medical and or non-medical services. So if an agency, for example, Life Home Health is a registered agency with accreditation through ACHC, the Credit Crediting Commission on Healthcare. We have accredited for skilled services. So we have gone a little bit higher than what um, ACA requires and gone for that accreditation in order to provide the full range of services in your home as you age so that you are able to access everything that you might need um, if or when you might need that in your home, all the way through even to the therapeutic side. So I think the most important thing to really consider is you. What, is your, what are your needs? Try to anticipate those. Call early 
um, connect with some of these uh, agencies or registries, interview them both, see which model fits best for your lifestyle. Um, do you want a relationship, you know, ind independently with your contractor and, and someone to oversee that relationship? Or would you like the agency to oversee that for you and do all of those checks and balances and employ that person and take out their payroll taxes and all of that? So um, the connection is really important, the reputation of the company. Um, there are franchises out there as well as um, independent models. We're just a little grassroots effort ourselves. And so we're not, um, you know, associated with a franchise model of any kind. We're, there's just one of us here in Southwest Florida. Um, and it's, and I'd say one, I enjoy. one takeaway is to not hire the, uh, the nice lady at the public supermarket, supermarket checkout line that you see each week. Um, that can be very dangerous. And we can all talk about some horror stories, but uh, we, we would go on and on with that. So. <laughs> You know, that I've seen that myself and, you know, there's a tendency to do that and, and really put that trust out there, but there are some pretty shady folks out there too. So you okay. definitely want someone else holding the bag if something goes wrong with an insurance policy to cover that. Exactly. All right. We are going to pop back over to Jen just for a moment. Um, Jen, Joe even said it, and I'll say it again. We use a lot of acronyms in this business. When it comes to um, looking at assisted living communities, talk to me about the, the, uh, the definition of people throw around ADLs a lot and they use acronyms for the licensure, an S and L and E. Um, talk to me about those two um, items, please. Sure. So ADL actually stands for activities of daily living. And uh, basically the easiest way to think about that is ADLs are things that we do every day. So uh, dressing, bathing, eating, uh, personal grooming, getting around. Uh, that's really what ADLs are going to consist of. And that's important because it really uh, falls in line with different licenses that an assisted living facility can have. So they work hand in hand. And there are actually three different licenses that an assisted living can hold. Uh, the first is the standard ALF license. And that license uh, has to be acquired if a, a facility wants to open their doors. So uh, it, it, is, uh, it, it provides basic assistance, uh, again, for ADL. So dressing, bathing, transfers, feeding, personal grooming, medication management. Um, again, it's the basic level that every single assisted living facility in the state of Florida has to hold. The next level up from that is going to be an LNS license, and that's limited nursing service license. And that includes everything that the standard license includes, but also adds on uh, basic services that would require a nurse. So uh, nurse evaluations, um, catheter care, uh, wound care, press, pressure sores, and I'm not a nurse, so <laughs> all of this is very, very medical to me, but it, anything that would require a nurse, that's where the limited nursing service license would come in. And then the next level, which is the highest level of licensure, is the ECC license, and that stands for Extended Congregate Care. And again, that's everything that a standard license or all the services that can provide that a limited nursing service license can provide. And then also the ECC is basically total care. So oxygen therapy, um, again, catheter, you have all the nursing services included. Um, the ECC license, and that's what Arbor Glen, which that's our assisted living facility here at Arbor Trace, we hold an ECC license. So we can provide a very high level of care similar to a nursing home or a skilled nursing facility. And so uh, really the ECC license bridges the gap between independent living, or I'll say assisted living, and a skilled nursing facility. Um, it's that special, special license that, um, you know, I really highly encourage people when they're looking for an assisted living facility is to look at that licensure. Um, if it only has a standard license and you need oxygen one day, there will come a day where that facility might say you, you, need, you need to be in a facility with that has an ECC license. So I think looking at the licenses and educating yourself on that um, when you're shopping around is very, very important. You don't want to get in a situation where you're in an assisted living facility and you need a type of care and 
they can't provide it. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's important to look into that, definitely. Perfect. That's a great explanation. I love hearing you um, give it. Thank you. All right. So an example of that is if you have a diagnosis for Alzheimer's or dementia, um, you don't want to look at a community that doesn't have a secure memory care environment. So we'll bring Gay Hallowell on to talk to us about what exactly, um, when should you start looking for a community um, that offers memory care if you have a diagnosis? So I think some of the, the things that have been said are so important, proactive, education, finding out what services and programs and care support is at that community to be able to go on. And not just for the individual who's going to be residing there, but also for their family. Um, a situation with a diagnosis of dementia, whether that is Alzheimer's, Lewy bodies, vascular dementia, or other forms of dementia, is a medical diagnosis. So when we're looking at memory care, that really should be the educational process that comes when one is diagnosed by their significant other, their spouse, an adult child, to start to become educated. It doesn't mean that it's time to move someone to a community, but it is time to start learning about communities. Dementia, sadly, is a progressive disease. And as such, it's going to go through various stages. And so one of the most important questions to ask is, is a community prepared to deal with all stages of dementia? And a huge part of that has to do with uh, behaviors that can manifest themselves with the disease. This is a disease of the brain. So everything is controlled by the brain. So we're talking about mobility, we're talking about cognitive functioning, language skills, eating, all these various types of situations. And oftentimes dementia can be like a dripping faucet over a long period of time. Other times that faucet gets turned on and the disease can suddenly start to progress much faster. So when you are, it's going to be the caregiver or the adult child that's going to be doing this research far more oftentimes than it is the individual who has the diagnosis. And so the questions to ask, taking that approach, the most important thing that I can encourage people to do is make their list of questions. And if they're really at a point where they're not even sure what the question should be, call a community that specializes in memory care and ask to speak to one of their representatives or in my case, the director of community relations to help even walk you through the system. It doesn't mean that you're looking for care immediately, but it means that you are preparing and you are knowing at some point you may need this care for your loved one. Um, all too often, I work with families who have exhausted themselves as the caregiver trying to keep up with the needs of someone with dementia and those changing needs. And they, the first and foremost one is safety. The safety part comes with being in a secure environment if there is at all a risk of someone wandering off. Um, that type of secure environment is very difficult to have in the home uh, simply because Oftentimes with dementia, people can get their days and nights reversed, and wandering can often happen in the middle of the night, not necessarily when the caregiver person is awake with the individual. They may not even hear the person leave their home. And so there's all types of things that come into play with that in terms of safety and security. And all too often that can lead to isolation. Well, we can't really go anywhere because I'm worried that my husband, my wife, my mother, my father could wander off while I am just turning my back for a minute or two. And I've heard these stories and are too familiar with knowing these stories that that can happen. So there's all kinds of ways to kind of lead up to the safety issue that someone can talk with you and share with you. And then, at the point where care is needed and the plan is there, then it's all about the services, quality of life, on-premise physician services, on-premise diagnostic services, whether that's mobile x-ray lab services, 
dentistry, PT, OT, speech, because transporting someone with dementia off-site to go to those types of appointments becomes more and more a challenge. Waiting rooms, where to park, you can't leave the individual by themselves. So asking the questions about on-site services is really important. And then the last thing that I would just say is that the goal for any memory care community is to have the person have independence and quality of life to meet the needs that they have. So a trained staff in dementia care is different from a trained staff in perhaps um, assisted living or with other ADLs. It's really understanding what's involved with the needs of someone with cognitive impairment and then be, being able to provide the individual programs, activities, and services that that person needs. Now, Gay, you touched on this a little bit, but talk to me. A lot of people are, are sticker shocked when they go into a memory care only community and they see the prices. There's a reason that, uh, that you guys um, as a memory care community have to charge a little bit more. Talk to us about that specialized touch and why it is a little bit more expensive. So the training and the care model is what memory care is all about. Um, not so much about lifestyle, the programs and activities are gonna be geared towards that care model. What type of activities can help with cognitive functioning? What activities help with language skills? What activities help with socialization? Um, what care services are available if behaviors such as paranoia or hallucinations start to present themselves? So memory care can be um, more expensive than traditional uh, assisted living, but the thing that um, that is important to me about memory care and something that we offer and I encourage people to ask about is that we do have an inclusive pricing model. We know that this is a progressive disease. We know that care needs are going to become greater as the disease progresses. So if there is an inclusive care model versus what's called levels of care, um, because dementia can literally change very quickly, especially if there's an event, a fall, an infection of some sort, that can have disease progression happen at a more rapid rate. A family that's trying to make a plan doesn't want to find out, oh, well, starting tomorrow, you have an additional amount of money that's due because the care need is higher. So in memory care, it may look more uh, costly initially, but the question to ask is, is it inclusive? Is that rate inclusive of care versus separate? And then knowing what those add-ons are. And the last thing that I, I just want to emphasize in terms of um, a memory care model such as ours is that we are prepared to work with our residents through all phases of disease including hospice care. And I introduced the concept of hospice care at my very first meeting with the family because the eligibility for hospice services for someone with dementia are not the same as what we traditionally think of with hospice care. Hospice can often come in much earlier. And that is a Medicare program that can pick up the costs of some of the, the care that is involved with the individual. And I introduce it so that it is not a frightening term, but one that is part of the care plan process in understanding how that, that is going to go forward. Yes, as uncomfortable as it is to talk about, it is something that is inevitable and it must be discussed. So um, I, I do like that you bring that up in the very beginning because it's a service that we all pay for and we should be utilizing for sure. All right, so those are my questions for each of you panelists. I'm gonna open it up to Q&A from the audience. And Michelle, I'll bring you back on. Thank you, Amanda um, and everyone. I, I know I personally found um, this presentation to be extremely informative. We are uh, beginning the search ourselves and to assist in the research for uh, my in-laws. So definitely very informative. As I look at the attendee list, one thing with our virtual platform, we are able to 
bring in everyone from all over the county. And uh, where typically here at, at the Lee Health Coconut Point, we would focus more on um, the South Lee County and the North Naples area. So for those uh, that are out there that maybe live in a different portion of the, the community, do these um, facilities have reciprocity at another location or um, how might someone at another location um, find value in, in this information? So I can answer that. We have a sister community up in Cape Coral. So if someone is further up in um, Lee County um, that offers both assisted living and is now offering memory care as well. So if location is something that um, is important, perhaps especially with your hospital system or the like that you've been used to, um, then it, it's nice that there is another neighboring community um, within the realm that has the same philosophical base. So there are the two of us right nearby here. And we're in North Naples, so we do have a lot of our families coming from South Lee County, um, particularly Estero, Bonita, and the like. Perfect, thank you. And the question that I'm getting, actually it's coming up here a couple of times, um, just with uh, the pandemic. Can you guys talk about what safety measures are now in place uh, at your communities and maybe uh, what information or resources should our uh, attendees look for uh, regarding these safety measures as they are doing their own research? Well, I'll start off. I mean, this is um, from a Continuing care retirement community, our residents are independent. So they are, they're in their own apartments, kind of like Jennifer, same thing at Arbitrace. I mean, they're living their lives just like they would if they were in their own home. So they're, we are taking extra safety precautions. We've had to shut down services and amenities, just like any you know, clubhouse or gated community. We're slowly opening those back up to make sure that it's um, safe. And have we, you know, has it been hard? No one expected a pandemic, right? So, you know, the recession, yeah, but a pandemic, we're like, whoa, okay. So we're all we're all a little caught off guard. Um, I think from what I've been hearing from the industry is that everyone's really working hard to make sure that we can get everyone's life back to as normal as possible. But the reality is there will be a new normal, just like the kids going back to school, just like the restaurants and, you know, having the patients, the residents are very happy. And I think that anyone on this call or, or webinar will tell you once they've made a decision, they're very happy that they're there. I mean, Rory, you probably have that all the time where people are like, why didn't I do this five years ago? You know, they're committed, they're there, they're working with the communities and really trying to get back to the new normal. So it's safety first. And I think that that's where, you know, all of us, I, mean, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I mean, in the industry, that's where everyone um, focuses on resident safety um, and progressively getting to where we need to be to normalize. And hopefully we'll be able to normalize more and more and more as we find a solution to this. I do, uh, I had a question come in about pet policies um, at each of your communities. Roy, what's your pet policy over there? Uh, we do allow pets um, under 20 pounds. There is a one-time pet fee. Okay. No restrictions on breeds? Uh, no restriction on breed. We just have to have vaccinations and, and all the follow-up from the vet. Okay. Gay? We can have pets visit if we have their vaccination record on file, but they cannot stay um, with a loved one simply because of the care that's required of a pet. But what we do have is mechanical pets yeah. that are so lifelike and offer such comfort, um, whether they are a cat or a dog in style, um, that is a huge part of what we offer in terms of our quote unquote pet therapy. We also, and we're anxious for things to open back up again, we do have pet therapists that come in with pets yeah. um, and they're just a wonderful resource for everyone. But unfortunately, we're not able to have residents have pets on premise. And That's I've actually good. done an SBB Live pet edition with one of the mechanical pets with Rich Chicklow from Comfort Keepers, and they're very lifelike. They are. <laughs> Like Kelly, what were you? Catch you off guard if they're on and start purring and meowing. I can tell yeah, you that. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, I was just going to just interject and say that's a perfect opportunity to hire a companion to bring your pet to see you if they need that extra love and support. 
I couldn't agree more. That's a really good point, Kelly. So um, if, if you have left your, your loved one at home, your pet, which for me would be huge, um, I would definitely have a private caregiver bring me my pet to visit. That's a that's every day. <laughs> Uh, Jen. Um, At Arbor Trace, uh, we do allow pets. Uh, there are some restrictions, two pets per condo or, or home. Um, they have to be at least 30 pounds or under. Uh, so no ginormous cats or anything like that. <laughs> and then in the assisted living facility, um, we don't allow pets to live there, but we always have pets visiting. Um, family members uh, will come in and bring their pets. And then also we uh, have some uh, special guests that come in, mini horses and raccoons and things like that that are, that are pretty cool. So Sounds like you need to talk to Gay about the mechanical pet. Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm like, I've never heard of that. I will absolutely have to look into that. That's very cool. <laughs> All right, Joe, over at Bentley Village. Pets? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. We have a, a weight policy. I mean, you can have a really skinny, you know, labradoodle or a, you know, so it really just depends. Really what we look at is can someone control their animal? I mean, we don't want to, most people, when they're making a move like this, you know, they've been with their pet for a long time. So, you know, to ask someone to say, hey, you, you know, it's, it's hard. So we work with people uh, just to make sure that they can control their pet. Most people have either a small dog or a well-behaved dog. You don't see many older adults with wild, you know, crazy dogs. You just see crazy people like me who have two crazy dogs that, you know, so it's like, usually it's, it's, you know, we work with people, but you know, I think pets are so important to everyone right now. So it's really, you know, that companionship. And like Kelly was saying, you know, think outside the box, like get people to interaction, even if some of the mechanical pets are, are wonderful too, but the interaction is phenomenal. That's awesome. Okay. Roy, we had a question come in that I wanted to ask you. I know um, we've talked about with Jen and Joe, financial assessments um, and uh, looking at investments. When you're looking at a traditional independent living community that's a rental, do you have to submit any kind of financial um, documentation or is there a healthcare assessment when you're coming into your community? Uh, we do not require uh, any financial assessments for our rental community. Um, we can do an assessment if a family um, feels they might be on the border of independent living and assisted living or they kind of just want our opinion, um, but that is not a requirement of our admission at a community. Um, you know, we, we, like we are a month to month, so if things do change, someone can make an adjustment. Um, it does give you the freedom, so I've had residents who uh, change and go up north, you know, with fam closer family members, you know, family members' lives have changed. So it does allow that freedom to move out if needed. Perfect. Perfect example. All right, guys. Well, if you uh, have anything else to add, please give me a little hand raise. If not, I want to thank you so much. Michelle? Amanda, yes. Um, of course, the Seniors Blue Book is the resource, and um, anyone that uh, has uh, <laughs> questions about uh, the speakers today and their uh, specific facilities, they can consult the uh, Seniors Blue Book. But is there, uh, if they do want to learn more or they have a couple of questions for you, uh, is there a way that our attendees can get in contact with our presenters? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what we can do is, uh, Roy, do you want to give your phone number? Oh. I'm, I'm mute. Sorry, absolutely. Uh, my phone number is 239-301-4239. Um, and my name is Rory, R-O-R-Y, Mitchell, M-I-T-C-H-E-L-L. -L. Okay, Gay, um, I know you had a closing remark and go ahead and give your contact. Yes, on the, on the heels of talking about the, the finances, um, oftentimes families are, do not quite have everything in place. Um, sometimes the preparation has not been able to happen because an event has occurred that has changed everything in a matter of days or even one day. Um, we do offer, in those cases, a 30-day respite program. And I consider that a respite program for both the individual who needs to be with us as well as the family to figure things out. Mm -hmm. And those respite stays can be extended or they can be converted into a long-term stay. Mm -hmm. But again, we are not a buy-in situation so someone could give a 30-day notice if their circumstances changed. We have found our respite program incredibly popular um, for those who come down for season. 
realize that something has changed. They are not prepared in their current environment, their condo, their vacation rental, whatever it might be, to care for someone. And so a respite might be the perfect fit for them. Someone else may realize they have to pursue guardianship because there was not a power of attorney in place prior to a diagnosis or what have you. Respite might be a good answer for that person as well. So the other part is that because families are trying to make this huge decision, oftentimes they need to just have time to be able to make that decision. And knowing that um, they can have an option that does not hold them on a long-term basis, particularly if they're not sure if they're gonna stay here in Southwest Florida or maybe head back north at some point. Those options are important. Um, I'm happy to discuss that with people. And the other piece is what happens if I run out of money? And that's another huge question in the programs. Um, is there someone that's on the team uh, that can help guide you, whether it might be veterans benefits or Medicaid benefits or what have you? So I welcome your questions. I can be reached at the Opal at North Naples, 239-598-1368. Again, my name is Gay Hollowell and I'm the Director of Community Relations. And thanks so much for letting me be part of this today. Perfect, thank you, Gay. All right, Kelly? So on that note too, as a resource, uh, you know, our team has been around for a collective 75 plus years, myself 27 of those years in healthcare, senior housing, Medicare, home health, independent, assisted, skilled nursing. So I would love to just be a resource for any of your clients at any time. And then our complimentary assessment is a free conversation in your home, over coffee, in a Starbucks, or wherever you feel most comfortable to talk about your needs or your loved one's needs. And that assessment is complete with a home safety checklist, a plan, putting that in place for free. Um, we utilize the file of life with the sheriff's department. So we'll put that in place regardless of you coming on service with us. And that's something that's really important because if we can just make that connection, if or when you need us in the future, we're there, it's already established. So that early conversation is key and at least getting that life profile, especially if you have dementia, any kind of dementia, if you're living with that, that life profile now is important because if you were to ever be admitted to the hospital, most of what they need, you're not, you may not be able to give them in terms of um, kids' names and pet names and things that are comforting when you're going to a new environment. So we're taking that extra step right in the beginning and doing all of that complimentary for you, whether you choose life, home health or not. So please reach out and use us as a resource in all of our collective years and we'll be happy to guide you. No, no questions asked. Um, and connect you with other partners in care in Southwest Florida. So we can be reached at lifehomehealth.com or 239-444-5965, Kelly with Life Home Health. And I would encourage you to compare at Home Care Pulse. So homecarepulse.com is basically your private world, third party provider that calls all of our families. It calls all of our caregivers. So we are graded on many metrics, all of us in the private side. And that's something that we pay for and we subscribe to so that someone else, a third party is asking those critical questions. On the Medicare side, it's medicare.gov. So when you're going out and shopping, who do I call? What do I do? Am I ready? Um, those are two really great resources. On the Medicare side, again, medicare.gov, compare your home health agencies and then home care pulse for your private groups. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, Jen. Yeah, so uh, again, my name is Jennifer Hoops. I'm the Director of Marketing, and you can reach me at 239-598-3490, or you can visit our website at arbortrace.com. There's a wealth of information on there, uh, including the independent uh, you know, uh, side, the assisted living facility, and then all the properties that we actually have for sale today. So you can check that out. Perfect. Thanks, Jen. Joe. Yes. So um, closing your mark, I just wanted to say thank you again. And I think that education is really important. And I also think that if, you know, most older adults are afraid of care. And I think that, I think we can all agree that it's, you know, 
we're all going to need care at some point, right? It's just a matter of, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And doing your research is just so important. And Kelly, thank you for that, those websites. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that people need to know um, and pass that along, even if it's just yourself or a loved one or whoever. It's all about the research. And no one wants care, but if you need care, you want to have the best care, right? So it's, it's all about that type of research. So Bentley Village, um, you can reach Bentley Village at 239 uh, yeah, 239-597-1121 or at uh, vliving.com, you know, plethora of information on the website as far as floor plans and pricing. But again, thank you very much for having us. All right. Thank you, Michelle. Any closing remarks from Lee Health? Um, no, just want to thank you all for joining us for another Healthy Life Center and Seniors Blue Book collaboration. Um, we look forward to seeing you at uh, future events. Again, uh, make sure that you mark your calendars for October the 26th. It's a Monday. And, and again, Medicare, Medicaid. Amanda, it's always a pleasure. You bring um, such great panelists with so much information. And uh, if anyone does not have access to a book, uh, either reach out to Amanda if you feel comfortable just giving us a call at the Healthy Life Center, we have a stack here. I'm happy to mail one out, but we want to provide you with those resources. And again, thank you, Amanda. Uh, we appreciate you and we look forward to next month. Thank you. Have a good one.